So um, the talk was uh, essentially this is the one that I wanted to uh, talk in uh, in uh, math in the brain, but uh, partly there was some kind of uh, miscommunication, and partly uh, it was my fault. But uh, I went through things really quickly, too quickly, possibly. So um, I, I wanted to explain properly uh, because I uh, prepared it well. And also, I'm also writing this uh, thing uh, in both Japanese and also English. Uh, so I wanted to get some feedback from you guys about what this, well, what do you guys think? So um, roughly speaking, the uh, left side of the figure is about uh, your dilemma that I have uh, explained a couple of times. And then it's a sort of a core of the, core of the structure, which I will go really quickly. And the right side is the one that is new thing. I, I mentioned it a couple of times in the lab meeting, but you know, more proper today. All right. The central issue it, uh, I wanted to uh, tackle with uh, today is the central issue in consciousness. And then for that, I want to use this category theory constants. That's a sort of a big idea. Um, the two situations to uh, I'm going to highlight uh, to uh, explain why we need this. And uh, um, the, the reason why this uh, um, is the um, question you know, that occupies the central stage of conscious research it is a question about the relationship between query that we are experiencing itself and report. Okay. And then uh, to specify three significant sub issues, and then we'll discuss uh, three approaches to address each of these issues. So, two difficult situations to consider. The validity of reports to the query. So, um, you know, broadly speaking, you know, when we talk about consciousness or query uh, feeling, we want to report, right? And the report is the one that we can analyze and then uh, classify and so on. Uh, but how much we can uh, trust the reports or how much uh, we can uh, report accurately is uh, often um, the central issue of the debate. And situation one is that uh, difficulty in describing any experience, um, the, in particular, for example, red, right? That's a philosopher's favorite, you know, example. If I ask you to describe what this is, then uh, you don't know how to describe it other than, you know, oh, that's uh, similar to Ariel's, you know, clothes or, you know, two, a little bit more brighter than my clothes or something like that. You know, comparison, similarity, metaphor, analogy, that's the only thing that you can do pretty much. And that's one of the um, defining character, according to, for example, Dennett, that the query is something that you cannot describe in affability. Okay. And then uh, for that, what we uh, have been uh, proposing is the Yone Dalema approach. Rather than relying on one point description, uh, use extensive relationships to characterize uh, what the red is. Like how this is similar to this, how this is dissimilar to that, and so on. If you ask many, many times, then we can eventually identify this. That's a sort of a Yone Dalema idea in category theory. And then the situation too is this uh, new thing, but we have been discussing, and also today, also, you know, we touched upon to some extent, difficulty in describing all of what we see briefly. That's the sort of a sparring ex experiment or catches experiment or you know, Turing's experiment as well. And this is the part that I introduced this uh, concept of adjunction. These different measurements approach to test the effects of interference between the measurements. That also touches upon your project, quantum coordination as well. Okay, so um, just a bit more uh, of the situation too. So if you see this kind of a red array, then you feel like you see 12 letters placed in a particular location. But when you try to describe what you describe or what you saw, you can't. Like, you know, um, we, we know that uh, if you try to describe it only up to four letters, more or less, it's uh, correctly identified in a particular location. But you feel like you saw everything, right? And the important thing is that the, after this is uh, extinguished, if you are uh, asked to report top four or middle four or bottom four, then you can do it actually. So that means that at the time when it disappears, you it's not like you, for, you, you remember only four of them. You have 12, 
And then if you're asked to report one particular thing, then you can report up to four, but it's lost. So that's a kind of paradoxical kind of situation. And this is a Kian the experiment or the Chen's experiment, but here uh, sort of the situation is similar. Um, you, feel, you know, if you are shown really briefly, you feel like you, know, you see them clearly. But for example, in the case of the you know, things, because this one is quite, you know, a uh, small object, dynamite, instead of a bucket, many people miss it. So uh, there is some kind of, you know, um, uh, issues. And here, this is the uh, Eiffel Tower, and then you can uh, describe many things about this, but the issue is that, that when uh, these rich kind of experience, each of the moment is uh, composed of the various uh, you know, objects, and uh, in itself, it, it feels like informative specific, and then integrate you know, all at once and then exclusive we don't experience no more or no less, which is more or less what IAT is trying to you know, identify as an, uh, you know core fundamental property of any experience. But even if you feel like this is correct, you know, when you try to report it, you know, that there are some uh, question mark, right? Like because you can't report really accurately. You might um, uh, ask, you know, oh, maybe experience itself was not definitive, or experience itself was not specific, and uh, so on. So that's the kind of the issue. On the other hand, uh, so the accessible consciousness, you know, or sometimes called the access consciousness, compared to the uh, phenomenal consciousness as well, or this is a pretty much a report. Then they are, you know, really there, and then also, you know, um, specific and definitive, but in a really limited way, and also effects of others, um, um, you know, uh, aspects. And that's a sort of the curing experiment of the starring paradigm. So there is this, you know, divide, right? Phenomenal versus access consciousness, and the phenomenal consciousness is the one that, uh, like, subjective and the gradient and experience of even private. And many people, including myself, thinks that you know, this is the target of the consciousness research. This is the only way, you know, uh, why this is so exciting and interesting. On the other hand, other types of the people have uh, said that the science can only deal with objective measurable behavior reports and attention and uh, public data only. So there is a divide, and then there are some people who are kind of intermediate. Maybe you know we can do both, or you know we can. Um, we are not sure what's the relationship um, they are. So that's the reason why I think you know there is still like a room to clarify what the um, uh, and the scope or, or relationship between those two concepts are. Okay. So uh, and in fact, if you so th this is part of the historical review of my paper, right? So she's there. Historical roots to this debate, in fact. And then you see Descartes uh, over there. But uh, since Descartes started to split the world into objective and subjective uh, in uh, dualism, you know, many people have followed this kind of uh, suit. And Galileo has already um, identified that you know, we can, uh, science should focus only on the objective work, and the subjective should be outside of the science. And then uh, Newton said that uh, uh, nature is written in mathematics, and mathematics is the language for science. And many people believe that you know, uh, mathematizing consciousness is impossible, and therefore consciousness shouldn't be uh, inside the purview of the corner science. And Kant made a quite uh, 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 important uh, historical remark that you know, uh, basically mathematizing consciousness or psychology is impossible. And his uh, view is that the uh, observation is inaccurate. And that leads to this impossibility of science, which sounds OK. But uh, if you think about it carefully, it doesn't make much sense possibly. Because you know, nowadays, you know, you know many scientific fields incorporate or sort of you know, accept the measurement errors, right? And then to what extent you can make a uh, statement is um, sort of the uh, scientific field to go. But anyway, and then following that further, there's this you know, uh, concept of psychophysics that you are doing in many cases. And that's still embracing this Kant's idea. But there, uh, Wundt's idea is that we can, uh, yeah, sure, you know, uh, subject to the report is really inaccurate. Inaccurate in the sense that if you're just reporting your feeling, that's not going to be a science. But Wundt, 
said that if you perturb the system with some kind of a fixed input, like a red patch, a blue patch, or something like that, repeatedly, that minimizes this you know, uh, uh, error in the observation. And that's what we should focus. That becomes physics, that becomes a side physics, right? And that's a strict side physics kind of view. And then um, uh, that went far to Skinner. Right? Skinner then eventually arrived to the uh, conclusion that you know, if you fix the stimulus input outside and then observe the outside output behavior, then you don't need to you know, care about anything inside. And even don't care about what you experience or feel at all. Only thing that matters is the input and output only. And that's the behavior. So, but then uh, against this, you know, there are several um, uh, kind of you know uh, approaches that goes against uh, Stevens uh, global side physics and the Shepard uh, similarity is in a way, in a sense you know going against this kind of side physics movement. You know we take seriously similarity report or magnitude estimate which doesn't have an answer, but people can make a very you know consistent and reliable report. And then let's build side physics or psychology from different ways. That's a, a sort of their different kind of you know, approach. So we are following this in a sense. So um, just to uh, uh, explain this. So yeah, because of this you know, su success of the science or technology focusing on the objective, I think there is a strong bias or belief that we can identify a state of a system only by precisely measuring objects. And uh, that's a probably uh, belief and uh, not really true. At least if you go into the quantum system, that this is not a, a true state. And then also uh, relatedly, um, this is also kind of important thing which relates to this, you know, adjunction idea that the state of a system can be described in a single perspective. If you look at the thing, from one point of view, but very precisely, you can understand what it is very, you know, as, as much as you want. So single coherent viewpoint exists. That's a sort of another belief. Okay. And this is both, I would say, intuitive, and it also is um, related to this, what I call object-centered uh, perspective. What I, I kind of discussed this with Agas today, but, we, we tend to think that science is a kind of, you know, approach to approach some kind of you know, fixed thing, which you can describe completely and then delineate from anything else. And that is true from any different viewpoint, right? Like if you want to describe this, you know, cup, you believe that, you know, once you describe this scientifically, you know, you can, um describe and also predict anything that will happen to this in the future or in the in the past but if you take different kind of um, perspective that may not be true so that that's a sort of category theory perspective or the relation center uh, uh, perspective right what defines this you know cup is not the cup itself but the cup's relation to the world like how it's used by me or you know, in the future, maybe alien or you know, artificial intelligence or something like that. Depending on how it relates to others, that's a sort of you know, defining uh, character of the object. Okay, so here, then uh, we need to uh, uh, take two steps. One is a uh, loosening definition or identification, and then uh, another one is uh, uh, by loosening the definition of the object itself, then we get the precise definition of the relation. That's the idea. I don't know whether this starts to become a bit too abstract, but I'll just go, go ahead. All right. Um, the, yeah, I'll just skip uh, uh, other part uh, because I, I may come back uh, later. So if you are taking only the sort of object-centered kind of viewpoint, the only way that you can identify this object with another object would be Something like, you know, whether this is identical or not. That's a sort of the identity relationship. You know, when you classify the object, that, that, that's pretty much the only way to deal with it. But if you start to uh, think about the relationship, then there is a uh, different way, uh, levels of the similarity. And this is one of the 
important thing in the category theory. And then today I'm going to introduce this, you know, isomorphism and also adjunction, but especially adjunction. Okay. And uh, when we are talking about, but, you know, what do we mean by, you know, what can be precisely behavior reportable, we, you probably, you know, have an idea that, okay, there is a uh, set of qualia, like redness and so on, and then that precisely maps onto this particular report, this particular report, this particular report, right? And then that kind of mapping is called dijection or one to one uh, mapping or, you know, isomorphism at the level of sense. And I'm saying basically this is too strict and too uh, not too useful to think about. And uh, this is a set theory, Jack, right? Yeah. yeah. So you, you think about object as an element, and the element element kind of mapping is the set theory, right? And then if you go to the graph theory, then the uh, idea of this isomorphism starts to become one step further. So here, you know, you have A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, and A, B, A prime, B prime, C prime, B prime, but they are called isomorphic because it's not, because it's not only, you know, mapping of the element exists, but the connection between the elements are also mapped, you know, coherently, right? A goes to A prime, which preserves a starting point and end point. And then B prime goes to C prime through B prime, which is also this one. So now you start to become more relation centric, but it's still kind of weak. And then, uh, so can, uh, the question becomes like, you know, we can, uh, can we do something more with the loosening this, you know, uh, uh, definition of sameness? So if we think about, the uh, categorization experiment where you know you are showing this you know, type of four, uh, four colors and then your behavior response or cognitive access could be either warm color versus cold color. Then all three of them will map to warm color, right? And then all the, this one is going to be called cold color. And then, yeah, both you know, graph theory or set theory wise, it's not the same, it's not isomorphic. And that could be the end of the world for those who are centering on the object, object uh, centered way, but you know, relation wise, it's not. So um, just to, uh, uh, I, I think I'll just skip this part. Yeah, so here we start to uh, talk about the adjunction. So when, when you start thinking about, you know, things in a category theory, you always need to think about object together with the relation, okay? So instead of thinking about like, uh, uh, do, do you, uh, did, did you learn that in high school, like an atom model, right? Boas model, like, you know, um, oxygen has two, you know, kind of sticks and the hydrogen has one stick, right? It's not like atom is just one thing. There is this, you know, connection, which is not connected to the other one. So, here, uh, when you talk about the category, it's not only ne it's, it's necessary to think about object, but also what kind of relations we think. And then I'll skip this, but you know, if you think about the color query as a color of objects and then similarity as a relation, then I think we can consider it as a you know, category. That, that's written already in the paper. And then another category is access again in this categorical response and then uh, ro is similarity then this is another category and then question is what's the relationship between the query category and the access category and it's not isomorphic so far right and then here is the um about one proposal one is this uh things called a functor i i drew uh animation in uh in, the, uh, in answer to uh, angus the request but the functor is something that maps each of the objects to another object, and also you know a uh, relation to another relation. So here there are three relations, all maps onto this same uh, relation, and this one goes to that, and this one goes to this, and that's a valid functor. And then going back functor is also okay because this one goes to here, and then this one goes to here. Okay. I don't know when, when I say this one, you guys on the online, you, you won't see it, but uh, 
Yeah, sorry about that. All right. And then uh, that, that uh, if you can go from one category to the other category and then coming back to exactly the same location, that's a categorical isomorphism. And here you can, right? If you start from uh, orange, you go to red and then you come back to red. That's not categorical isomorphism. But then what about a, a junction? That's the, that's the issue today. A junction is a case where you go from one category to the other and then come back, but it's always there is some kind of discordance. But the discordance is so coherent and so nicely uh, you know, organized that you can always have a relation between them, all the other relations, systematic relation. That's the junction. So it's the, even if there is a discordance, it's okay as long as there is systematic creation in discordance. So uh, as, an, uh, as an example, uh, this is a really simple example, but you know, real number and integer. Together with this relation of you know, smaller than R or equal to, right? Then if you think about this for a moment, and then as a functor, I introduced that as a sort of seeding function, functor. And uh, functor also map, needs to map this arrow as well. And the arrow goes to the same kind of arrow. Smaller than equal becomes uh, smaller than equal. And then if you do that, 2.3 goes to uh, C, D, C, D. Three. three, right? 2.4 goes to 3.1 goes to. Yes. So that's the functor here. Okay. And then that preserves the relation. And then, however, this is not categorically in isomorphic, right? Um, no matter how you do it, it's impossible to make some kind of isomorphic another functor, you know, going back to the same location. And one uh, way to think about it is uh, another functor is just as it is. Three goes to three, four goes to four. That's a very simple kind of functor, but it, it's fine. And then this is the case of the adjunction. And why it's that is so <laughs> from here it's a bit complicated, but I'll just try to explain. A junction, like an, uh, uh, many other uh, concepts in category theory, is a bit uh, weird if you think about all of the concepts of object as thing like this. But really try to imagine, you know, uh, all the definition of the category theory as you know atom model. Like it always has to have some kind of you know stick from there and in this case it's also the case of the adjunction is that three things as one set it's not the one thing okay and the adjunction is defined with a pair of the functors f and g together with a natural transformation which is a discordance or displacement and these three things as i said that's an adjunction and that's a meaning of the three colors Okay, so then um, to define it properly, what it means is that x uh, for any real number x, you know, you can come up with any number, and then let's take it as 2.3. And any f that connects x to g of y, and in this case 2.3 is uh, less than 4.3, 4.0. Then there is a unique g. That goes from f of x to y, like three less than four, such that f is composition or combination of tx then gg. And probably this has to become very complex, right? And that's the reason why I prepared the um, animation. So, so far here, what I'm saying is that any kind of real number you come up with, okay, that's a 2.3. And then any kind of uh, you know, relationship that corresponds to x to gy. Uh, because g is, you know, uh, as it is functor of the integer, it has to be some kind of integer with 0, 0.0, right? So it could be 5 or 5.0 or 6.0 or 2. But if it's 2, then there is no r. Because r means that you know, it is smaller than. So it qualifies for three or four or five or six or something like that, but no less, and also you know, uh, no 
of the uh, different kind of you know bad numbers, real numbers. If you take a different G, that's no longer the case. But just uh, just to uh, make it simple, I, I won't say much. And then let's consider f of x. There's a unique G f of x to y. In this case, f of x is always three, right? Because it's two point three. And then this after G it uh, maps to four, and the four maps to four point zero. And then this is unique. It exists always. That's what it is claiming. And then such that f equal t g g. But here so far it's fine. Like um, 2.3 moves to there by f, and the f three is less than four, and four maps to four. And then that's already you know going this way. You know you can go exactly one way. And then this part, such that TGX, GGB, that's the critical part, right? If you map this three with G, then we come here. And then that is uh, this part, okay? So G, after uh, using the G, if you map this F of X, you get 3.0. And then the discordance from the original location is this T. It's a sort of minimum ceiling of this. So there is, well, this is the 2.3 is always uh, smaller than or equal to 3.0, right? So there is always an arrow. And then the 3.0 is less than 4.0. So there is an arrow here. And this, this arrow is the one that you move from this uh, arrow, G into G of G. And then magically, you know, it sounds all complicated, but magically, when you start from here, it always, always have this, this displacement plus something that is not from the right side to the left side. And when this kind of coherent relation exists, it's called a junction. So it's not like, you know, when there is two uh, two wars and then there is some kind of discordance, anything goes with that junction. The critical thing is this existence of this natural transformation. Some kind of displacement is always there. It's coherent and it's guaranteed to be there. When it exists, it's called a junction. So it's a loose kind of similarity, but it is a very important kind of you know a systematic and coherent kind of displacement, right? Just. Question So, is every solid arrow and can we read all of them as a less than or equal to? Yes, okay. and the dotted arrow is just a functor. Okay, any other question? Fine, is that little g implying a, yes. a functor? Or no, 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 this one is also less than or equal to. That's a that's a number three is less than four, right. So I mean that energy is a relationship. This or... is a relationship. Okay. And then this relationship is mapped by G to G of G, which is again less than or equal. So it's okay. And then this three maps to 3.0 and the four maps to 4.0. So this is less than or equal, also maps to less than or equal. Right? If you think about it one step by step, then it should make sense. But it's probably a bit, a bit too much to take in one bit one more. Okay. Yeah. Um, what's an example of functors that aren't trying to jump? Uh, so, for example, you know, you can, uh, maybe I shouldn't say that. Uh, maybe, maybe let's, let's, Come to that after I finish the recording because I, I don't want to read uh, something that is completely wrong <laughs> and then uh, remain in the uh, recording. All right, fine, so far. Okay. And then now comes the critical application to consciousness research. And I'm proposing maybe Gloria and access is the situation of this adjunction. So a uh, pair of functors again from query to access and access to query, and uh, when there is 
you know, for any query x and uh, any relationship that exists x to g of y, in this case, it's a similarity, right? Then there is a unique f of x to y g on this side, such that f equal t and uh, t then g, g of g. So let's see what, how it works. So in this case, you know, f maps to uh, axis, and then that maps to red, right? Because we have this in you know, a warm or uh, cold kind of response, and here's it is. And then this is similar to this redness, and then that maps to redness. Makes sense. And also, this relationship, this is a similarity, also maps to similarity here. And then this T, if you, uh, you know, if this is similar, this is also similar, right? So again, this makes sense. And if you think about it as a sort of sanity check, what happens about this in a cold color? Because there is no, you know, arrow from here, arrow into here, right? From orange or red, it doesn't, you can't draw similarity. And it also doesn't exist here. And this guy can go here, but you're not across. So at this level, I think a junction is existing here. And here, if you think about it, the situation is quite similar, right? Like a query is like a real number. You know, it's fine and, you know, very detailed or, you know, something like that. And then you can't bother as, as it is, but when you categorize it, you know, bother it, report it, like a similar directly from minus four to four, there isn't an orderly relationship here, this, you know, discordance or, you know, that displacement is there, but it's always there within a re reason. And that's the reason why we can communicate and, you know, uh, uh, share the experience, I think. So the conclusion is that the uh, uh, query and access are possibly related in the sense of adjunction. And if you want to make it continuous, it's possible to do because, you know, uh, adjunction exists in also the continuous domain called the N-Digital category. Uh, but that's uh, more complicated, so uh, unnecessary, so I, I will not talk about it. And then uh, just to conclude, uh, to uh, discuss the implication. So first of all, you know, I think this offers a new perspective on the debates around access and co uh, phenomenal consciousness, which has, been, you know, if I'm right, you know, it starts starting from Descartes, right? <laughs> but now we can probably coherently, you know, understand what this, uh, their relations are potentially. It's not isomorphic, it's not the same, but it's an adjunction. And then uh, here, um, so the category theory approach, you know, from uh, for the Yonema approach, you know, we propose this similarity uh, experiment. And similar thing is this, you know, uh, this um, effects of measurements or what kind of factors result in, you know, uh, may, uh, so in a sense, in you know, Jack's question, the kind of the adjunction. If you impose some, you know, unclear factors, from right side to left side, then it won't work as an adjunction. So which kind of, you know, factors are necessary is one question, empirical question. And then uh, to understand uh, why, you know, the order of the similarity rating matters, that could be also uh, potentially explained by this kind of thinking. You know, from left to right, comparison to right to left, there may be some kind of ordinary discordance that uh, may be the quantum similarity modeling. And also uh, sparring experiment, you know, probing um, images or words or descriptions or uh, instruction. By that, maybe sometimes there's an, um, you know, interference going on from one side to the other, and that that result in this, you know, or, uh, some kind of, you know, uh, displacement. And the old task or attention manipulation is also one thing, probably. So uh, I think I repeated this one. Yeah. That that's uh, so that hopefully kind of address this uh, central debate in consciousness research, and I, I'll just skip this one. This is uh, this is all right. That's it. Thank you. All right, Aniko. Can you go back to the slide with the qualia and access uh, and the adjunction illustration. So yeah, so this one. 
So here the order effect would be explained by P. Whenever like that, that would be the consistent that is kind of quantified. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so if we took this to, we're trying to like shine some light and clarity on access versus phenomenal consciousness debates. So on the right hand side, we've got access consciousness. On the left hand side, we've got uh, those who think there's phenomenal overflow. Uh, there's more going on than we can accurately describe. I'm confused as to how we could ever characterize X, which presumably is what we're trying to do. Is to... uh, function? No, the little F, sorry. This? Yeah. So how do how are we going to handle on that? Because it seems you could have different um, little apps and not be able to capture that in any way. So f is the little f here is, is similar. Yeah, similarity judgment itself so, within this locality of capital. I guess that's what's confusing me. So if if we can just directly get f, then isn't that a matter of access consciousness where like. We don't need to bother with no 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 no. Okay. If you don't feel, uh, imagine that there is no arrow here. Okay. If you don't feel that this is similar to this, yeah. Right. Then uh, the prediction is that it doesn't actually result in this kind of you know uh, uh, arrow. I mean that uh, this doesn't map to this reliably. In this case, you know, I'm kind of you know I'm simplifying this um, to the extent that I'm forcing this to always move this but uh, if you don't think you know if you don't feel this to be similar to this but if you feel similar to this one then instead of this arrow but you map uh, x to this cold color okay maybe maybe I'll, I'll take a step back in my question then if we adopted this is it allowing us to do anything differently empirically than we already can or is this more just a different formalization of the access versus phenomenal consciousness debates so the, uh, the empirical next thing what, what we can do is uh, something that we need to think about but you know, i have several ideas one of the thing is that uh, to think you know rethink this what is f and what is g right f is in a sense as a whole of this it is an experimental paradigm right yeah so that that kind of starts to become closer to what you are doing in the sense like when you are shown you know natural patches you know you can do many things but in that case what you we are doing as f is that you know judge the similarity of the color and then we can do different kind of uh, you know uh, you know functor to judge something different and then uh, we will characterize this you know structure with different functors and uh, whether, whether that, that result in the adjunction or not, that's you know um, something I, I need to think about. But so that that kind of uh, relates to this final figure that I briefly mentioned. So I don't know whether I should uh, talk too much about this, but uh, so when when you have two categories, one is in a sense, known or measured and concrete, and then another one is unclear from outside. But you know, this is concrete for, from inside. Then uh, there are ways to sort of the understand this relationship through the sort of the outside manipulation. One is like a dynamics masking or like perturbation. You know, by changing this, you know, that those relationships can be systematically manipulated, right? And so with uh, realization and awareness that it could differ based on the context. Context meaning here is an instruction or attention. And that can also manipulate here. And then this quality kind of relationship between you know, this unknown and known and the dynamics and the manipulation of context is according to Ojima with the uh, supervisor, previous supervisor of time zones. Um, he he thinks this is a fundamental kind of you know structure of understanding of many things. And here, defining the context limits what we are addressing. You know, we are not saying that you know 
with, with this kind of perspective, it's not like this is just one thing, right? Depending on the context, depending on task, we can reveal this in a different way. Where would neural, yeah. neural basis or neural uh, data fit into this? Or it's just not, not relevant? Here? here it's not. But you know, if you think about uh, the concrete uh, 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 application to neural, is that uh, you can think about this as a sort of a, uh, actual neural systems here, which is very difficult to measure in the human brain, right? And this is an EEG or fMRI. There is, a, it's not definitely isomorphic, right? Because it's approximation in the temporal or spatial resolution. But it's also, you know, too strict to say that, you know, you never understand anything from uh, about this from this measurement. That's really ridiculous to say as well. You know, they are different, but different in a way that, you know, there is some, you know, coherent discordance. And that's why we are we are interested in that, uh, using these two measure this. And then also, you know, part of the system, and also, you know, or differ or understand the limit yourself in a different kind of context. Don't overstate and don't overstate or understate. You, you can actually apply this to many kind of you know, applications. So the key idea is using using observable external relationship to infer something internal and unobservable, like quality or neural activity. That, that's a general frame, exactly, yes. Yeah. So, uh, I'm, so this is slightly, it's still related, but slightly further afield. Have you talked to philosophers or have any interest in talking to philosophers to try and settle on the terminology for what you're doing here versus related terminology in philosophy? I just know because like a lot of what you're describing seems similar to debates in philosophy around qualitative versus quantitative identity or types versus tokens or other like notions in analytical philosophy or mm -hmm. philosophy of what similarity is mm -hmm. and like using this category theory approach does seem to be a better way of describing it often than what they do there but i just worry that like we get too many different groups in different places using different terms and it gets confusing um, so i just wondered if you Ever spoken to no? I mean, this is the first time to talk to you guys, <laughs> and um, I don't know uh, what, what they say. You know, uh, I'll post this to YouTube, and then if they have some opinion, then they would come to me. <laughs> yep. If you know that it's two things, like there's the adjunction. Mm. What can you do with that knowledge? Like, how does it help you? This particular experiment? Yeah. Or yeah, in the particular example you're giving us, if you know that they are a junk. So, for, for example, this Ojima's um, example, I, I'm not also sure exactly what what we can do, uh, but so that, that's the kind of thing that I, I'm still thinking about. But the exact you know, finding of the particular functors or tasks uh, to identify what, what kind of relationships is an ordinary or not that's one thing right well uh, and then coming back to your original question um what's what, what kind of functor doesn't actually uh result in this R junction i'll explain that uh, now if i understand correctly if you try to use a functor g for example with a division by two or something like that then it won't work. If you shift by one or uh, divide uh, di divide or multiply this, uh, that still works, I think. You, you need to think about it very carefully. But you know, for example, you know, if three maps to three point two always, then four maps to four point two, right? That works. Yeah, but if you say it has like four maps to one on four and three maps. Yeah, four to maps three. to one, then yeah, this doesn't work, yeah. right? Okay. So there exists a lot of functor that doesn't work. Yeah. And in fact, a junction is in a sense, you know, some, some people say that it is a rare case of the world or the two completely different world 
where you can start to find an optimal solution between these two mountains. Then you can find that junction. But you know, as you already noticed, if you you know try to map four into minus one or something like that, then it doesn't not work. But from the isomorphism, uh, set theory isomorphism kind of you know, the, uh, thing where you don't have any kind of restriction in terms of relations, it's totally fine, right? 2.3 can map to one, and then two can map to minus one, as long as uh, in the five elements here and the, uh, five elements here, it's totally fine. But because you have a constraint of the relations, coherent relation, you can't work that way. So in, in that sense, uh, we, we are just only starting this you know, query structure kind of thing with a similarity as a sort of a relationship here, right? And then similarity here. But it's it's not necessary that you know to capture the query, we always need to use this you know, uh, similarity as an arrow. And in fact, it's unlikely to be the case that you know it exhausts all the relationship. We, Try to do a little bit of self physics using something like you know uh, preference. But preference is also a kind of ordinary concept, right? Like if you prefer this over that, and then prefer you uh, this over that, then it also predicts that this is preferred over this. So you know there can be multiple arrows between the objects, and then that has to be also satisfied with this. But whether we can do that or not, that's unclear at this stage. All right. Is there any question, comments? Okay, then that's it. Sorry, I did I did have one. What's the metric for this, like the measuring qualia itself? Is that just like you know comparisons and, and people's like subjective? Like something on like a like a Likert scale or something, or like how do you um, measure that component of it? Yeah. So that, uh, as I said, that the first thing is the similarity. Right. And in this particular case, it's uh, you know, to for the simplicity, it's binary. It's either <coughs> similar or not similar. And yeah. then to make it more continuous or graded, then you need to use this uh, uh, notion called the uh, enriched category theory. But enriched category theory is uh, more complicated, and yeah. So, but but basic setting works. So you don't need to worry too much. Anything else? All right. If not, then that's it. Thank you.